In the same way, I took the consumer script, uh, the belief that uh, the whole world and its resources are available to us without regard to the neighbor, and looked at what some of the bloggers have labeled uh, big shit on, excuse my French. Uh, the economic meltdown sparked by subprime mortgages. And what a, a, even a cursory investigation reveals is that a big shit pile uh, was caused by predatory practices, which is part of a pattern dating back to the savings and loan crisis of the 1980s, uh, at the very least. But pushing even a little further, we begin to see that these market crises uh, are the direct result of an economic system that is rigged to keep the little guy there. That is to say, the logical consequence of an unjust economic system is that that system is unstable. When our political and economic leaders begin to understand that, we'll be able to move into more progressive territory. More to the point, it is only by uh, creating a more equitable society that we will be able to uh, get ourselves out of this boom and bust cycle engineering ever more complicated rescue packages for Wall Street bankers is not going to cut it. So there's the technical script. Our economic woes are a matter of justice, not of shinier algorithms. And uh, finally, for the uh, militaristic script, I looked at the uh, issue of torture from a theological perspective. The usual uh, religious take on torture amounts to, it's wrong, don't do it. Uh, however satisfying and clear that might be, it doesn't help us understand how torture comes about and why. So following uh, William Kavanaugh, I suggest that torture is a self-justifying practice meant to protect and defend the national identity. The way it works is this. Uh, everybody knows that torture is wrong. Right? We all know that it's wrong. But, says Kavanaugh, torture is a cultural taboo. It's something that we know is wrong, uh, and therefore won't discuss openly, but which we feel is necessary. And what makes it so necessary? The fact that we do it in the first place. This is where this self-justifying part comes in. That we have to do these awful things to these people is evidence of how awful those people are, and therefore that, that we have to do this in the first place. So you can see there's this kind of uh, circular logic uh, to this. And it is a way of creating and enforcing these sharp divisions between the us and the them. Kavanaugh thinks that uh, the corrective to torture is um, the Eucharist. His line of thinking goes, Torture destroys community by dividing uh, uh, the community into us and them. But reconciliation at the table relativizes those divisions and unites Christians in the one body of Christ. <coughs> and I, you know, I think that's quite right. Uh, but I also suggest in the book that uh, progressive believers undertake the work of atonement uh, for the sin of torture. I have some uh, specific suggestions for how that might be done. Uh, but here's one in particular. We know that uh, torture finds the most civilian support uh, in authoritarian religious communities. Uh, conservative evangelicals are the most likely to approve of torture, with conservative Catholics not far behind. In order to uh, stop torture, then, we might want to find a way to counteract the authoritarianism uh, that funds it. So as it happens, we also know that authoritarian communities cannot abide diversity. They depend on this assumption that everyone has a role to play and that they better stick to that role if they know what is good for them. So when we advocate for same-sex marriage or for gays and lesbians in the military or for racial justice in the broader society or for the, the acceptance of Muslims, we limit the reach of that authoritarianism. If you can't divide the world up into these neat little boxes of us and them, you make it much more difficult to torture. <coughs> so there are these uh, scripts that we need to, to uh, challenge. And as I say in the book, I, I offer these 
uh, not so much as an agenda, but as a way to help people understand the right questions to ask of today's situation. And because this is, after all, a work of theology, I uh, suggest that people ask those questions in a godly way. I know that I've rattled on for quite long enough as it is, I'm already wearing out my voice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that was a laugh line, but I'll write that one in. Oh. But I want to, to read to you from the very end of the book, um, where I suggest that um, the idea of gratitude ties it all together. For it is gratitude more than anything else that allows us to ask the questions rather than provide the answers. Gratitude subverts the scripts that they claim to our lives and to our ultimate loyalties. When we affirm with glad thanksgiving what God has done for us and look with hope and trust to the future into which God leads us, we offer a powerful, quiet challenge to the scripts that dominate our lives. In this light, even the simplest actions take on great significance. Brueggemann cites as an example the observation of Mark Douglas that regular table prayers of thanksgiving are a primal way in which to challenge the market view of supply and movement of valuable goods. I honestly believe that to be true. In giving thanks for the food that we receive and for all God's goodness, we proclaim our freedom from consumerism, militarism, therapy, technology call into question the failed promises that they make. In this way, we are slowly remade. The future we yearn for comes closer to being a reality in the present. So it is that I want to conclude with what will seem like an embarrassingly simple question. Why not begin or continue the journey of the religious life, not with polls or positions, but with a prayer? Common table grace uh, may not mobilize people of faith, people of faith, to vote a certain way, nor does it have immediate policy implications. It does not even provide an obvious alternative to conservative or religious perspectives. But to pray in this way engages in the most transformational politics of all. I often use some variation of this prayer in our homes. Gracious God, loving Father, mystery, you are our hope. We know that only you can keep us safe. Only you can bring us joy. We give you thanks for all your gifts to us. We pray that you lead all people into your future. And fulfill the promise of your love for us. This is how the scripts are countered one small prayer at a time, offered at one dinner table at a time in this slow, difficult way that resists programs and agendas, we set ourselves on the open-ended journey toward where God may yet lead us. We give voice to the questions that must be asked and so open ourselves to better possibilities, or so we hope. There's nothing perfect about it, but it, it is faithful, more or less. It is a way of walking with God, and only in that way can the movement that calls itself religious find and articulate the meaningful alternatives it has to offer a nation starved of possibility and locked out of its own future.